All right, let's jump right in. Let's get rolling. Hey, let me ask you a question. How many of you want to be blessed by God? Let me see your hand. Come on now. You want to be blessed by God, every single one of us. I mean, we've got to really get to a point in our lives that we really want his blessings. Because if we really want his blessings, that means we really got to do what he's asked us to do to get those blessings. Right? You could do your own thing and not live in the blessings of God, right? But you could do his thing and be overwhelmed by his blessings. Deuteronomy 28 tells us that if you obey the commands of the Lord, his blessings will overwhelm you. I want to be overwhelmed by the blessings of God. I want to live a miracle life. Anybody else? Come on, church. I want to live that life that's overwhelmed by the blessings of God. I want to be honest this morning. I have a heck of a lot to say. And I don't know if I'm going to have time to say it. So I'm going to get through what I can get through today. I love talking about money. You want to know why? Better to talk about it because I don't have it. The truth is I love talking about money because it's a biblical principle that a lot of people overlook. They don't talk about it enough. Churches don't talk about it near enough because pastors are afraid that someone will say, all they want is your money. We just gave away 26 free books. That's not about getting, that's about giving. That's the generosity of our church. Always wanting to make sure we provide for every single person. The Bible declares this, give and you will what? Receive. Oh, say that loud and proud. Give and you will? Receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Well, that's a little scary, isn't it? Because some of us, we don't give what God has asked us to get, and we expect more in return, and we haven't invested anything. Anybody invest in your IRA, your retirement stocks? You don't put anything in. You don't get anything you have to invest or plant in order to have a return. Let's do this as we get rolling today because this is the verse that's going to guide us today. Would you stand to your feet? And we're going to read this verse together and we're going to make this our declaration of belief today. So loud and proud like Jesus is standing right next to you. Because he is. Here we go. Give and you will receive your gift All right, look at somebody and say, I'm ready to be blessed. And you can give them a high five and you can go ahead and be sick. Come on, I'm ready to be blessed. All right. Well, today is Miracle Offering Sunday. And we believe that as you plant a seed, you will see God do a miracle in your life. Today, I want to spend some time talking about the sweet spot of stewardship. Today is going to be about a discussion about how we spend all the resources that God has blessed us with. See, I think one of the things that happens with churches is they don't talk about all 100% of our resources. We only usually talk about the 10% you're supposed to give to God, right? But we don't talk about how you manage the other 90% of your resources. There's a story in the Bible. It's a parable. A parable was a teaching of Jesus used to create a truth so people could easily understand the lesson he was trying to teach. This parable is called the parable of the three servants. Jesus tells the listeners that the owner of the land was going away on a long journey. He had three servants. He left them in charge and gave each of them some money. The first servant he gave five talents to. He would now invest that five talents that he was given, and he would double it. So this first servant takes the five talents he was given by the master, turns it into ten. The second servant is given two talents. He does the same thing, invests it, and he doubles it. Now he's got four. The third servant is given one talent. He did nothing with the talent but bury the talent. Because he felt like the master was a difficult man and did not want to lose his money. 
Track with me on this. A talent is equivalent to 75 pounds. 75 pounds of what? 75 pounds of silver. You imagine getting a 75 pound bag of silver? What is that worth? Well, in today's economy, silver goes for $210.47. That would mean one pound of one, one talent of silver would be worth $16,000. Think about this. That means the first servant in the story was given $80,000. Now, I don't know about you, I ain't handed any of my staff 80000 of my dollars. <laughs> well, I don't have it, but it'd be nice to have it. Right? No, most of us wouldn't do that, right? But he takes that, invests it, turns that $80,000 in today's economy into $160,000. Second servant has 32000 He gives back $64,000. The last servant takes that 16000 and he simply buried it and brought back to the master when he returned $16,000. What's the difference between the first two and the third individual? The third buried the gift. The first two planted it. Big difference. You bury what you don't think survives. You plant what you know will thrive. Catch this. You bury dead things. You bury things that have no life to it. Anybody had that pet when you were a kid? Come on, anybody? Had that pet when you were a kid? I remember we had this little toy Pomeranian. Don't even remember the dog's name. Cutest little thing. Bad breath, but the cutest little thing. Came running one day, and a German shepherd got into a little tiff, ripped its back leg off. We had to put that dog to sleep. We buried it in the backyard. It had no life. It died. That's what you do with dead things. You bury them. Can I tell you, when we buy things that we don't need, we're, plant, we're burying our resources. When we spend what we do not have, we are burying our resource. You guys tracking with me right now? When we take our lives and we put it to just entertainment, when we spend more money on certain things than the important things, we are burying the resources God has given to us. But church, God has not called us to bury our resources. He's called us to plant our resources, to put them in the right place and to cultivate a healthy life. Remember, Scripture declares this. Remember, a farmer who plants only a few seeds gets a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You see, in serving Christ, it's always about a lifestyle of priorities. It's about where, when, and how you invest the resources that God has given to you. How many have been blessed by God? Right? You've been blessed? If you live in America and you make more than $40,000 as a home unit, you are in the top 3% of worldwide wealth. And yet we still find things to complain about. I don't have this. I can't afford that. Listen, you have been blessed by God. You live in a great nation, and God has incredibly overwhelmed you with his blessings. Let me ask you, does anybody like sweets? How many people like sweets? Okay. Some of you are lying. Been out to eat with a few of you. Sweets, I mean, don't be afraid to put your hand up. I love sweets, but too much of sweets are not a good thing, are they? You ever ate too much chocolate? I know some of you think you can never eat too much chocolate. You can. I mean, it can put your digestive system in a very, very bad place when you consume too much of a good thing. I think in our world today, we're consuming so much that we're finding ourselves spiritually sick, physically sick, emotionally sick, relationally sick because we are not investing our lives where they're supposed to be. So, so I don't know about you, but I love sweets. I love them a lot, actually, probably too much. 
I love them more than, well, not more than steak, but definitely more than vegetables. But I want you to imagine your life is consumed, your resources are represented by this nice chocolate cake. I know somebody right now is thinking, man, I want to go up there right now and stick my face in there. (laughs) And so in your life, you have to look at everything you have 100%, right? Your life consumes your resources 100%. When you have your paycheck, you have 100% of it, or you should until Uncle Sam takes over. Some of you get that later. So I'm going to divide this sweet cake into 10 slices. See if I can do this right. Anybody believe that I can do this right? I don't believe in myself right now. Oh, I think I might have it. There's five. Oh, got to make sure it's almost even. Okay, there's five. So I got 50% of my life done. Then I got this side, and I'm going to slice down. Oh, crud, I think I messed that up. Stay with me on this. Oh, no, that's working. It's working, working. God loves me. So I'm, I'm putting my life into 10% increments, right? Each one of those represents a part of our life and where we're supposed to invest our resource. How many are hungry right now? I just pulled out the first 10% because that's our tithe. It belongs to the Lord. Come on, who believes that? That belongs to the Lord. So if I take this 10% that belongs to the Lord, so if I'm making 100%, 10% is his. Now, what do you think is going to happen if I eat God's 10%? I might get a little sick. I might not be as fit in every other area of my life. So the first part of what we have in our life, the sweet spot of stewardship, is our 10%, our tithe. It belongs to the Lord. Now, I know there's a lot of people that say, well, 10%, you know, that, that you know, that's Old Testament, that's it. Well, the truth is, I and Mary and I have been living with tithing since we've been married. Can I tell you, we're more blessed than most of our family. Why is that? Because many of them don't tithe. There is a blessing that comes. When it comes down to the tithe, a lot of people, well, that was an Old Testament thing. That's Genesis through Malachi. Can I tell you, tithing actually predated the Old Testament writing? It was considered what we call pre-law. So there's people that end up saying, well, that's Old Testament. We're under grace. We don't have to give. We can give whatever we want. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, Jesus is having a discussion with some Pharisees. They were the religious leaders of that time. And he's criticizing them for not honoring and loving people the way they should. He says this to them. You do all these things. Yes, you should tithe. But you should also love your neighbor. You should also care for the broken and the hurting. Jesus affirmed the tithe in Matthew and in Luke in the New Testament. So think about that. Jesus himself said, you should tithe. Now, when Jesus says a declaration, it's a you should. What does that mean? You might. It's a good idea. No, it's a command. And when you don't follow the command of God, what is that called? Okay, you can't even say it. It's sin. It's sin. So when we take that 10% slice and we pull it out and we say, you know what, though? I am, go- you know, I'm just, wow. This, this 10%, that looks so good. Mm. Mm-mm-mm. Mm. Oh, Jesus won't mind. That's so good. Oh, man, that's moist. Powder on there? Here's the best thing about it. It's gluten-free. Anybody who knows me, I'm GF all the way. But now I'm gluten-free. Now I'm eating what belongs to what? Somebody else. So now here's what happens. Now I'm eating what belongs to God. Oh, wait a minute. Now housing is another part. How many of you like your house? How many just don't like how much you pay for your house? Right? All studies indicate that your housing is typically about 40% of your annual budget. So now I'm taking my, here's 10%. Here's 20. Here's 30. 
Oh, Jesus, save us right now. That's a whole lot of money spent on housing, isn't it? Now I got my housing. Now think about it this way. If I eat some of this 10%, guess what now I have to do? Ooh, I got to take something from somewhere. So if I want to honor God my 10%, I've got to take some from here. Ooh. So now God is short. And when God's short, now our mortgage becomes short. Because we started with the wrong pro. This is so good. Okay. That's that. Let's put it up here so you guys can see it. Just, just let the moisture just settle. Oh, it's so good. Okay, but then what we found in a study this week is the average household in America is $10,000 in credit card debt. $10,000. Think about that. In order to pay that off, you know how many years it would take you to pay off your credit card debt at the minimum payment at $10,000? Huh, way longer. Almost 18 years. Think about that. 18 years. You know how much interest you will have paid? More than double what you actually spent. How many are th- sitting there thinking, man, those credit cards, man, they're... But you know what? Hey, Chase, they want your money. You done it. So guess what I got to do? I got to now take a slice. I got to put about 20% to pay down debt. So there's my debt payment. Hmm. Think about that. Then you have your living expenses. What are our living expenses? That's our food, clothing, groceries. And they suggest that you end up spending about 30% on living expenses. That's your utilities, school bills, all that stuff that you have. And now look at what's happening. What's happening to my cake? It's going ever. I'm just doing this. Here we go. <laughs> now what's happened to my cake? How much do I have left? Okay, simple math, guys. I took 90. <laughs> I have 10% left. For the additional stuff. So now God lays on your heart. I want to go on this mission trip. I don't have enough because I only got 10 left. Because I've mismanaged much of this. Are you tracking with me? I spent it. and, And all it takes is the first step is to eat what is God's. And then you have to borrow from something else to pay what pay God back. Does that make sense? See, now if I consume the cake that belongs to the mortgage companies, guess what happens? I get late fees. I get penalized. I become financially sick because now my late fee is a percentage of my actual monthly payments. So now I get financially sick. But if I take God's portion, my tithe, and I eat some of it, guess what I now do? I am robbing from God, and I remove myself from living under his blessings. How many of you want to be out of God's blessing? I don't. So that means I've got to live in a way that honors him. So here's the thing. Catch this. This is important. This may hurt some of us a little bit, but I'm going to say it anyway. The only people who complain about tithing are those who do not tithe. Oh, no amens. They're the only people. Oh, I, you tithe. You don't need a tithe. Oh, no, the church just wants money. The church wants... No, tithing is not about the church wanting money. Tithing is about you living under the blessings of God. We want you to be blessed by God. But when you rob from God and you do your own thing with it, you step out of the blessings of God. Tithers never complain about giving. I have never met someone who tithes 10% of their income to God. I can't believe I got to do this. You know, Mary and I last year, uh, 2017, we wanted to honor God with our resources. So we gave away almost 14% of our income. Why do I say that? Not to brag on ourselves because it was challenging. There were things we had to say no to. But that little boy that we support in Mozambique, 
That young kid that doesn't have anything, he needs to see the blessing of God. And I want to make sure I'm not you know, stacked up on Starbucks as much as given to the poor, the hurting, the helpless, and those who are mis- misfortunate. I want to make sure I'm putting my resources and I am planting my resources into what matters. See, people who tithe are living in the sweet spot. Because they've been given a financial pattern for how to manage the resources God has given to them. Let me ask you again, how many of you want to be blessed by God? I want to be blessed and overwhelmed by God. Then we've got to find the sweet spot of stewardship. And that starts with giving God his slice first. Not second, not third, not fifth, but first. Here's what I've discovered The enemy wants to keep you from greater resources. And that's why he gets us to believe the lie that we don't need to give God first. That Well, that's just a suggestion. No, it is a commandment by God. The enemy wants to keep you stuck in a spirit of lack, in a spirit of poverty, and a spirit of debt. He wants to keep you out of your sweet spot. He wants you stuck in credit card debt until you turn 99. He wants you depressed about your finances, overwhelmed with your loans, and discouraged about your tomorrows. That's what the enemy wants to do in your life. But God wants to unleash blessings and abundance and favor on your lives and your house. Come on, do you want to receive that today? I want to receive his blessings, his favor. I want all that and then some. God wants you to live in an overflow. See, the truth is everybody's got money problems. You know a problem? We don't have enough money. Every one of us deal with money challenges, mishandling of our resources, putting all the slices in the wrong place. The biggest problem we have today is not that we don't have enough. The biggest problem is we think we don't have enough. You've got the resource God has given to you. Manage it well. See, the enemy loves to keep you in a spirit of poverty because if he can keep you without He keeps you where you are, and he stops the church from plundering hell and populating heaven because he knows if you discover your sweet spot and you start to manage your money God's way, you will have more money than you ever imagined in your life and your wildest dreams, and you will invest and plant your resources where you can make the biggest kingdom impact and I know that the enemy wants to stop church unleashed from being radically generous because he knows how generous the house is and if he keeps our money in our pockets and we're not planning it he will stop the dreams the vision the plan and the purpose that God has for this house see God cannot keep you out of debt and the enemy cannot put you in debt that's all on you and me. The Bible declares this, the borrower is a servant to the lender. Servant in this passage literally means in bondage. That when you over borrow, you are now in bondage to someone else. How many of you believe God has called us to be free and never in slavery? Never in bondage to anything, but yet we put ourselves in bondage. He does not want us in bondage to anything. The Bible says, when the sun sets you free, you are truly free. See, I believe that there's a spirit of lack that many people have decided to live under. The enemy has lied to you. You can't have more. God does not want to bless you. You are not good enough. Push back and start declaring, I will be blessed coming in and I will be blessed going out. I will have more than enough. I will be a blessing to my family, my friends, and those around me. God, you will pour more on me so I can pour more onto others. When God blesses you, that's an opportunity for us to bless more people. Refuse to let the enemy keep you where you are. He wants to get you settling that no, there's no more greater resource for you. You're stuck where you are. But I also believe this, the way you manage your money reveals where your heart is. If I look at your checkbook, I can tell you what you value. 
Jesus said it this way, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. In other words, how you handle your money matters. It matters. In fact, I, I'm so proud of Malachi. Malachi, he got his Christmas money, and, you know, he always immediately, when he gets his money, because he always, just money, just give me money. And so we give him the money, and everybody, just money, don't, no gifts, just money, let him pick out his clothes or whatever he wants to do. He gets his money. You know what he first sees? 10% belongs to the Lord. He cuts it right off the top. This year, you know what he did? Dad, I'm going to give more. I'm giving 20% this year. Well, think about that. Why is my son living that generous principle? Because he sees mom and dad do it. So follow me on this. National giving has gone down in the last 20 years to churches. Churches are struggling to stay open because people have stopped being faithful to God in this area of tithing and generosity. We are not handing that spirit down to the next generation. Instead, we're handing down to the next generation. It's all about me. I, gotta, oh, for, I need to spend 50% of my house, so I'm going to borrow from God. Well, how many of you know when you borrow from God, you never pay back God? He's the one who doesn't. But if you steal from Uncle Sam... Unless you're a politician. But if you steal from Uncle Sam, there's a huge penalty, right? Huge penalty. It's typically 30%. 30% and they compound it every single day you do not pay. So that 5000 you own in just a little bit could become $30,000 that you owe the government. God doesn't do it that way. What, he, what we do when we don't honor God is we actually step out of his blessing. God wants to bless us. I want to be blessed by God. The Bible is the manual for wise money management. There are over 2,350 verses on money in the Bible. 16 of the 38 parables of the gospel that Jesus shared were all about money and possessions. That's 42%. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels, one out of every 10 verses, 288 total, talk about finances. In fact, Jesus talked more about money than any other subject in the entire Bible. Does that shock anybody? I think he talked about it that much for two reasons. One, God knew finances would be part of our daily living. Two, God knew that finances would be a motor to expand God's kingdom. And he wanted to make sure we were using our resources right so that God's kingdom, that hit the son, Jesus, could be known throughout the whole world. How we handle our money often reveals where our heart is. And this is vital. We've got to understand this. I've got to jump ahead. Stewardship is an act of faith. Honoring God with your money, your resources, your blessings is an act of faith. There was a well-worn $1 bill and a similarly distressed $20 bill. They arrived at the Federal Reserve Bank to be retired. As they moved along the conveyor belt to be burned, they struck up a conversation. $20 bill reminisced about travels all over the world. I've had a good life, he said. I've been to Vegas and Atlantic City, restaurants in New York, performances on Broadway, and even a cruise to the Caribbean. Wow, the $1 bill said. You've really had an exciting life. So tell me, said the 20, where, what, where have you been throughout your lifetime? The $1 bill says, oh, I've been to the Methodist church, the Baptist church, the Lutheran church. $20 bill interrupts and said, what's a church? See, when God, when we steward our resources the way God designed, we unlock a new level of faith. Sadly, we put more money into entertainment than into God's kingdom. That's, you, you say amen if you want. Make me feel like you're hearing me at least. Okay, maybe not. Okay. Planting a seed is a step of faith, and God honors faith. Scripture says it's impossible to please God without faith. Full life financial stewardship is one of the greatest steps of faith you can ever take. And finally, we've got to understand this morning, give God the best, and the rest will be blessed. If you give God the best, the rest will be blessed. So I'm just going to finish with reading a scripture, and we're just going to let it settle here. Malachi chapter 3. Will a man rob God? 
yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Notice, the prophet didn't just say tithes. He said tithes and offerings. Tithes are your 10%. Offerings are above and beyond, like some of our kingdom builders in the house. Listen to what it goes on to said. You've robbed me in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Now, let me explain that to you because this is important. It's not that God is cursing us, but understand this. We live in a fallen world, and the only way we can stay under the blessings of God is when we're in alignment with God's principles. Does that make sense? God wants to redeem our finances from under the curse, and that redemption of our finances, that blessing comes when all of a sudden we give God the first. Verse 10 says, bring the whole tithe. How much? Come on, like you, like you love Jesus. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now, here's what's interesting. God says, test me in this. This is the only part of Scripture where you and I are encouraged to test God. It's the only place. He says, test me in this. Give me the best and the rest will be blessed, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. Come on, somebody. I want some of that. I want some of that blessing where there's not even enough to contain it. And then listen to this. Verse 11, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. God is saying, you know what? If you tithe and you give above and beyond, I will protect you. There is a protection comes when we manage our life and resources the way God has asked us to. The vines in your fields will not cast their fruit. They won't lose their fruit. Then all the nations will call you blessed. Question has to be, do you believe what God's word says or not? I do. That his word says, if I bring God my best, the rest will be blessed. If I give God his first slice, then everything else God will constantly provide for me. I remember when Mary and I bought our house. It was the same time we were planting this church. I did not have any income. I had lost my job because I was at another church, and I went out in faith to start this church. My wife Mary was just notified just before we bought our house that she would no longer continue her employment. She was a leave replacement in Valley Stream Central High School. She was a leave replacement. Now, here we are. We just bought a house. We've got no money in the bank because we emptied it out to start the church. We've got no income. Now, let me tell you how awesome God is. Here we are in this point where we're like, what the heck did we just do? We go through this season of, oh my, here's what the mortgage company did not do. They forgot to do their income verification phone calls. They never called. They never called my former job, which was listed, that he was not going to have any income. You're not, you telling me that's not a God thing? That is a total God thing. We lived in that home for nine years. We just bought a new house. We lived in that home for nine years. I never once, went, well, I was late one time. That was when Bethany born. It was the same due date. That's a whole other story. But I, was, I called and actually said, I'm so sorry. I'm late. The lady said, you're the only person that's ever called to apologize. They're late for their mortgage payment. One time, nine years. Why do I say all that? Because when you put God first, when you give God your best, the rest is always blessed. What did God do for us? We were faithful and for nine years in our little 1,300 square foot house and God blessed us this last year with a 2,800 square foot house out of the proceeds of that. I mean, that is only God that can do that, but it's because we put him first. When you give God the best, the rest will be blessed. See, the enemy wants to keep you from being blessed, but God wants to unleash his blessings and abundance on your life. The way you handle your resources reveals whether or not you trust God. It's a step of faith to make sure that we're giving God that first slice. But if we eat that first slice, we become spiritually, emotionally sick because we're not honoring God and we move ourselves out of his blessings. Can we finish with this declaration again? 
It's the verse we read in the beginning. It says this, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shaken together to make room for what? That means when you spill out, he fills up. When you give away and you plant and you invest, God says, wait, I can trust you with more. You've been faithful with 50000 in income. You've been honoring me. I'm going to bless you with $75,000. That is how God works. So it's going to pour it. The amount you determine, the amount you give will determine what you get back. Look at somebody and say, look at somebody and say, I'm ready to be blessed. 